Today I found this very interesting concept that I want to share with you, which is called a wicked problem. Now, wicked problems are, according to uh, the Wikipedia page about them, difficult or impossible to solve because of incomplete, contradictory, and changing requirements that are often difficult to recognize. So essentially, it's a problem that is almost not possible to solve as a problem. It's wicked because any attempted solution is not going to seem like a solution to some people, or it's not going to be pleasing to some people, or what's necessary to solve the problem is going to change. So unlike an engineering problem where let's say you need to construct a bridge or create a new gadget, wicked problems have this sort of difficult quality, this nebulosity, which makes them very hard to pin down and fix. Now, the reason I wanted to bring them up is because although wicked problems were first defined in sort of a social context, so how do you run a country is a wicked problem because what it means to solve the problem of running a country is not clear, uh, that different people have different visions of how you should run a country. So libertarians think this should have a small government, you know, communists think that should have a totalitarian government. Different people have different visions of what it counts to solve the problem. And the requirements necessary to solve the problem are changing over the time. You can't learn through feedback, so you can't just run the country and then go back in time and do it again over. Every crisis, every individual event is to a certain extent new. So in this case, running a country is a wicked problem. But I wanted to talk about this because when I was reading the article, it made me think, you know what, life is a wicked problem. How do you live life in the best way? Well, it's not clear what it means to live life in the best way. It's not clear what it means like to solve that problem, to do that well. Different people have different ideas of what you should do in life and what counts as a solution to different life problems. Additionally, there's often changing requirements and you don't have the ability to learn through feedback. You can't live your life once as a dentist and then go back and become the musician that you thought you might be. You only get one choice. And so in this case, it's very difficult to figure out what you should do in order to solve this problem. Now, this idea of wickedness is also related to another idea which I've talked about before, which is David Chapman, uh, a philosopher and former MIT uh, artificial intelligence researcher, is he talks about the difference between pattern and nebulosity, as these are being kind of fundamental qualities of the universe that we experience. So pattern is the ability for us to recognize that there are things out there, there are things that we can understand, there's laws of the universe, and the problem is that when we see pattern in the world, we want to make it totality. We want to make it so that pattern is everywhere. We can understand everything, even if we don't understand it right now. In contrast, nebulosity is pointing to the inherent ambiguity of things. That any attempt we have to classify things ends up leaving some things out. Any attempt to draw boundaries between this group and that group, this category and that category, this type of thing and that type of thing, inevitably leads weird border cases where there are things which aren't really this, aren't really that, and we're not quite sure how to conceptualize them. So the idea here, metaphor, is nebulosity like a cloud, in that a cloud is an object. We can see that there's a cloud there, but it's also not clear where it starts or where it stops. What is the cloud? What's not the cloud? Is it one cloud or two clouds, or is it just a mass of cloud? This is the thing that is difficult. And I think this idea of nebulosity is inherently tied up in wickedness. Because what makes problems wicked is that any attempt to formalize them, any attempt to create some sort of pattern that says this has to behave in this way and this is what counts as a solution, fails in some regards because the problem itself is sort of ambiguous. What people want from the problem is ambiguous. What's the right way to conceptualize it is ambiguous. These are all difficult challenges. Now, this is all talking about it very abstractly, but one really concrete example of wickedness is coming from Kenneth Arrow, who showed in his 1951 book, Social Choice and Individual Values, that in some cases, things as simple as voting for what you want to do can be wicked problems. They can be solutions which don't obey normal principles. So what do I mean by this? Well, Arrow's impossibility theorem, which he proved in this, was showing that whenever you have to aggregate people's preferences, so meaning, think about a simple example, like let's say you and four friends want to go eat somewhere for lunch. Well, normally as an individual, you could think of, well, first I would like to eat Mexican food, and then uh, I would prefer, if we can't go to eat Mexican food, I would like to eat Chinese food, and then I would like to get a sandwich, etc., etc. Now imagine everyone has these kind of rank-ordered choices. 
Well, a naive expectation would be that if everyone has these rank ordered choices, there must be some way that we can vote. Some way, we, whether it's we each suggest our first choice and we go with whatever the majority wants, or we suggest our first choice, and then if we don't suggest our first choice is not a majority of people don't want to go there, then we eliminate that one and go with our second choices. Whatever you use as a voting system, that there are going to be situations where you don't have normal principles of this rank ordering. So that although each individual has a rank order of I would like this first, this second, this third, etc., it's possible to get in situations, regardless of what voting system you use, where you can have, let's say, cycles where the group prefers Mexican to Chinese food and prefers Chinese food to a sandwich, but paradoxically prefers a sandwich to Mexican food. So this is not something that you would expect if you just had a simple list of one, two, three, four, five, because these are no longer ordered. There's no longer clear winner in this group. But what Arrow's impossibility theorem showed is that this kind of problem is inevitable, that this kind of problem cannot be escaped by creating a perfect voting system. So in a certain sense, democracy is also a wicked problem, that we are not able to get clear and definitive answers by picking a certain voting system. Every voting system we choose is gonna have some problems. So this is an example of wickedness in a social context, but really even in your own mind, there is a certain sense that you are voting for choices, that it's not just merely you as an individual, but parts of your mind want you to work, parts of your mind want you to relax, parts of your mind want you to do this, want you to do that. And so even in this case, there is some certain kind of irrationality in how it selects what you are going to take action on. So even since making simple decisions might be wicked problems. So here, I wanted to talk a little bit about what you can do about wicked problems, or at least think about them. And I think the first step is just to recognize that some problems are indeed wicked. If you are to look at the world as if every single problem is going to have a cut and dry solution, every single thing that you try to fix is gonna have some simple procedure which will give you the correct answer 100% of the time, you're gonna be sorely disappointed. That even if we mathematically prove that certain types of problem domains don't have solutions, some people will reject them. That if we just found the right way of doing it, we would be able to solve the problem. So the first solution is just to recognize that in a certain sense, an incomplete or imperfect solution might be the only solution that is even theoretically possible for certain types of problems. Second, I think you can apply certain tools which will help you make better decisions even if they are still imperfect ones. So the first I wanna talk about is cultural learning. So cultural learning is based on the fact that individually in our lives, we only get to live them one time. So we can't really go back and learn from feedback and you know, do parts of our life over and over again. You can't marry this person and then go back in time and marry a different person. You can't do one career and then go back in time and do a different career. Sure, you can change halfway through, but that's often a very different kind of choice than going back to the initiating point and making a different decision down the road. As someone knows who's maybe changed their career when they're 40, they know that this is different than if they had just picked that career all along. So one way of avoiding this problem is cultural learning, is to get answers about how you should behave informed by the culture broadly. Now I know this kind of suggests a certain conservatism, but it really just provides you a default answer to things. And it's clear that this is how we learn to solve many of the wicked problems in life, is by looking around us and seeing what are other people doing and what have they been doing for hundreds of years and what have successful cultures used. And I think this is something that can solve a lot of problems that might be very hard to experiment on yourself. Another example is simply to adopt more perspectives. So even though more perspectives can create difficulties from this impossibility theorem of like, how do you aggregate multiple different ways of looking at a problem and find the correct choice, multiple perspectives can still be very useful because very often these problems don't happen, that you have a clear majority, a clear answer illuminates once you adopt multiple perspectives. So one example of a wicked problem is, what should I do with my career? And part of it is that it's not clear what it means to be successful with your career. Does, it's not clear what it means to have success. Does it mean making a lot of money? Does it mean being prestigious? Does it mean doing creative and passionate work? And so in this case, you can look at the concrete situation you're facing, what choices you're facing, and decide to adopt multiple perspectives. So adopt one perspective where the goal is to be as wealthy or financially secure as possible, or another perspective where the goal is to be as creatively fulfilled, or another perspective where the goal is to 
have a passion or service that you are helping other people. Adopt multiple perspectives and see how they weigh in on the choice you're making. Now you may have a situation where you have to do some kind of tiebreaker, but very often when you adopt more perspectives, a clear answer will emerge about what you should do. And then the final option, which is not really an option, but is really just a way of thinking about how you can perceive and wake in problems is recognize that they present an opportunity for genuine choice. That so often in life, if you have a formalization that tells you this is the right answer and you're an idiot for not following it, there's a certain sense that you lose that very human quality of having to apply all of your intelligence and creativity to a problem. If you can just follow a simple list of rules, then there's a certain sense that that problem has become trivialized, that that choice that you had to make in life isn't really that much of a choice at all once you can define exactly what the right answer is. So in this sense, even if you can't solve all of the wicked problems in life, I want to present you with the idea of framing it as this is an opportunity for genuine choice, genuinely a chance to express something where there is no right answer and you have to pick for yourself.